Good afternoon and welcome to another Research in Action brought to you by the Division of Research at Florida Atlantic University. With that, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Marian Porter. Dr. Porter is an assistant professor in our uh, Department of Biological Sciences here at FAU and has a significant expertise in biomechanics and has uh, applied that um, experience to a number of very different um, topics uh, that, that range from plants in the Grand Canyon to now sharks. With that, I'm just going to turn it over to her and you will see some very stunning scenery that involves sharks. Uh, enjoy. Hi, thank you for the Division of Research for inviting, inviting me to give this talk and thank you to everyone who's been able to join in. Thank you again for coming. I have been lucky enough to be at FAU since 2014. And um, as you can see from my research being located someplace so close to the ocean, um, especially here in Boca Raton has been really great for me and for my research program. When I came to FAU, I was able to start the Fab Lab, the Florida Atlantic Biomechanics Lab. And so today um, you'll see some of the research that I have been working on and you'll get to see some of the research that features um, work by some of my graduate students um, and I've been really uh, lucky to have some pretty amazing students here at FAU. So I want to tell you a little bit about biomechanics. Um, we're going to be thinking about how animals move. Um, biomechanics uses physics and engineering to understand how animals work. And so this is something that humans have been inherently interested in understanding for a really long time. Um, Aristotle was writing books called On the Movement of Animals about 300 BC. You've probably all seen the lovely anatomical drawings by Leonardo da Vinci and Giovanni Borelli, who basically drew out skeletal systems and started to think about how those levers work and how we actually work as animals. So humans, we've been really interested in this. And I was very interested in biomechanics. I, uh, I spent my early childhood life as a competitive swimmer. I had a very nice stroke, but I wasn't very fast. Um, but I came to appreciate the importance of biomechanics in my swimming. And as I became able to um, start going further into my research career, I had an opportunity to study um, biomechanics of sharks. So big questions that motivate my research are, how do animals move and how does the underlying skeletal structure or skeleton allow that to happen? And I can answer these questions a few ways. So I can study biological materials like the vertebrae seen here and the shark skin seen here. So I can study um, hard tissues from the shark and also the stretchy tissues like the skin. I can think about the mechanics or how these pieces work together. So. I can look at an individual vertebra from the backbone of the shark backbone, the vertebral column, or I can study the whole column and think about how that works. And lastly, I can think about locomotion. So how the function of these individual skeletal elements, this function of the bone can basically translate into different swimming styles in different species of sharks. And our work is currently funded um, by a National Science Foundation career grant that um, we were just able to start during June 2020, so about a year ago. So today I want to tell you about some of our current research and all of this is kind of coming back to that grant and what um, the purpose of the grant is, it's called a career grant. So it basically is like building on things I have been studying for almost the last 20 years um, thinking about the skeleton, skin, and movement in sharks. So we're going to start off talking about skeletal elements. And some of my researchers in the lab I've been able to work with include Dr. Danielle Engel, who is currently a postdoc at, um, so postdoctoral, she finished her PhD and is working at Texas A&M in Galveston. Um, and then Jamie Knob and Aubrey Clark are PhD students in my lab. So when we think about the skeleton of sharks, you might think back to what you've learned from Shark Week. Sharks have skeletons made of cartilage. Um, this is something that we talk about in almost every nature documentary, but it's often, I think, 
unappreciated in some of those documentaries. So if we think about the evolutionary history of sharks, sharks have been around for about 450 million years with a skeleton made of cartilage. And most vertebrates, which we are, you can see the vertebral column in the shark here, have skeletons that are made of bone. So studying sharks offers me a really interesting look into the evolution of skeletal structures in general, and also allows me to look at a really a kind of weird skeletal material because most, most animals, um, most vertebrates are going to build their skeleton out of bone. And when we think about cartilage in our own bodies, we're thinking about our ears, our nose, our joints, kind of squishy bits. And you have to wonder, or at least I wondered, um, you know, how do you build a skeleton of a predator that has been around for 450 million years out of something so squishy? And that, that's what I was really interested in learning about. And so here we have an x-ray of a little horn shark from California. On the left side of your screen is the jaws. You can see the heavily mineralized jaws. And on the right side of the screen is the caudal fin or the tail. And you can see that the vertebral column um, made of these individual little vertebrae travels along the whole length of the shark. And it's these nice repeating elements. So it makes it kind of easy for me to study and to model. And this cartilage has a ton of mineral in it. Um, you can see that because it's showing up in this x-ray, just like your bones show up in an x-ray, it's because we have a lot of mineral in our bones. And our cartilage would not show up as well. And in this shark, it's heavily mineralized. So we see the vertebrae really well. And we can see um, what these vertebrae look like close up. And we know that the vertebra shape um, of the mineral within the vertebrae actually varies a lot among species. And I'll show you that here in a second. Some of my previous research, I've been able to show that these little vertebrae are actually as stiff and strong as some kinds of bone. So they're not as wimpy as we might imagine when we think of our own cartilage. So already I was able to start learning um, that this cartilage is a little different and can do some cool things as a skeleton. Something else I was able to discover a few years ago was that each of these little vertebrae works as a spring. So it's similar to bone in a lot of ways, but it can also compress quite a bit. And a spring, if you remember way back to physics, is something that we can compress. And when we deform it, it goes back to its original shape. And so that allows us to store and also recover elastic energy, which is really helpful if you think about animals that have to swim around and hunt or potentially make really long um, migrations. So these vertebrae, are able to operate as, as that spring. And I also showed they're able to operate as a break. So under some conditions, they're going to restore and return energy. And in other conditions, they're actually going to absorb energy. And a great example of this is uh, something that you've probably all um, encountered in your life, a uh, silly putty. So silly putty, if you roll it up and bounce it, can bounce. If you pull on it really quick, it will snap. And if you pull on it really slow, it will kind of ooze. And that's a pretty extreme for a shark vertebrae. I can't get it to ooze. Um, but it does have a lot of those different properties. So I was learning a lot about what these skeletons are able to do. But a lot of what I didn't know, <laughs> well, there's a lot I don't know. I'll talk to you again in like 30 years when I get ready to retire. But a lot of what I had been able to study was only in like certain areas of the shark, like under the first dorsal fin or at the very back um, in the caudal fin. So I was never really able to look very um, comprehensively along the length of a vertebral column to understand what was happening. So what we were able to do a few years ago with Dr. Engel and I was we were able to get these six species, a dusky shark, a blue shark, a common thresher shark, a white shark, my students were all very excited to have white sharks to dissect, um, short fin mako and a poor beagle shark. So some relatively big fast swimming sharks. 
And we were able to study the vertebrae from the front and the back of the shark. And what we were able to do for these experiments was to take individual vertebrae that we had dissected and put them on a plate on a big machine that basically can crush things. And we were able to put our vertebrae on a plate and basically squish them to understand how squishy they are. And this is something I actually like to do in everyday life is if there's something around, I tend to like poke it and see how squishy it is. Um, this is not a great habit to have during a pandemic. I can tell you, I wash my hands a lot because I touch stuff. Um, but in terms of my science, it's kind of what I do. It's understanding how it works by kind of squishing it or stretching it. And so these vertebrae, we were able to squish them and stretch them. And what we were able to find was vertebrae in the front of the shark and vertebrae in the back of the shark operated differently. So when we squished them, the responses were different. And in fact, we found that the vertebrae at the back of the body were stiffer. And so what this means in an engineering sense is it's able to resist being squished. It's kind of similar to what we might think of stiffness in terms of colloquial um, meanings. But as a, as a engineer or someone who studies biological materials, really we're thinking about how it's able to resist being squished. And we found this in the back end of the shark. And I was very excited because this was a pretty common finding for all of these species. And so what I think this means is the back end of the shark needs to be stiffer. So it needs to resist compression so that these sharks are able to move their caudal fins back and forth. Here's a thresher shark with a really big caudal fin. So these sharks are able to wiggle their bodies and move their tails back and forth and generate thrust. And they want to have the stiffer skeletal elements in the back end of the body so that they're able to effectively swim. And that was really exciting. So I learned a lot just from squishing these vertebrae. But if we look back here at our, our vertebrae, they're highly mineralized. And it turns out that the mineral amount in this cartilage is also similar to some kinds of bone. So there's a whole lot of mineral in here. And it also has been well known for over a hundred years. Um, previous scientists had taken x-rays of a whole bunch of species that the arrangement or the shape of the mineral within each of these vertebrae can be really different and it varies quite a bit among species. So once we knew that the way I squished them was a little different um, from the front end to the back end of the shark, we wanted to look and see if the mineralization was different in the front of the back, because then we could start to build a story or have some ideas about why the posterior end of the shark is working differently and how that is. So what we were able to do in collaboration with the CT scanner over at Al's Imaging Lab at FAU High School on the Boca campus here, is we were able to micro CT scan a bunch of vertebrae. And so if you look here, we've got a mako, a poor beagle, a thresher shark, and a white shark. And these are all very similar to what I just showed you um, from that study where we were squishing vertebrae. So here are CT scans of these different vertebrae. And what a CT, CT scan is, it is basically the same as when you go to the hospital and you get a CAT scan. So it's a 3D X-ray. So rather than having a flat image, we can start to build these 3D constructions that you see in this top shape here to start to understand the arrangement of these different um, mineralization patterns. And if you look in this blue box, here are vertebrae from the front half of all of these sharks. And you can see that the way they arrange the mineral or the way these extra white parts are showing up in the CT scan is very different among these species. So this poor beagle has barely any of these plates. Um, we call these plates lamellae. So there are barely any in this poor beagle. It almost looks like a bicycle spoke. And the mako has more, the white shark has more. And if you look at this thresher shark, it's got a lot of lamellae. 
So this thresher shark has a totally different amount of mineral and a very different arrangement of mineral compared to this pored beagle. So that was already really exciting with that we were able to start to quantify how this mineral arrangement changes among these species. The next thing we wanted to look at was comparing the anterior or the front end of the shark versus the back end of the shark. And remember, we found the back end of the shark, the vertebrae were stiffer than the front end of the shark. So if we look at our mako and we look at a vertebrae from the anterior or the front and the posterior, the back, um, we can see that there are some differences. And if you actually count all these little plates, um, we start to see differences where we have more plates in the back of the shark than in the front of the shark. So that was really exciting when we looked at the mako. We see the same thing when we look at the poor beagle. So again, we're starting to see this trend where we're gonna have more plates to help support and create that stiffness that we saw in the vertebrae. And what we think is going to be important for helping us generate thrust or be able to push against the water to move a shark forward. And we see this in the poor beagle too. And next, I'm gonna show you something that has me really excited in the thresher shark. The thresher shark has some pretty wild differences. It already has so many lamellae in the front half of the body compared to these other species. But then if you look in the back half of the body, so many more plates are here, so much more mineral and that arrangement of mineral to create those stiff vertebrae. And they just look so wild and even different compared to some of these other species. We were thinking, you know, why, why could this be? And it turns out thresher sharks have that big old long tail, right? And several years ago in 2013, um, other uh, researchers were able to find that thresher sharks use that long tail as like a whip essentially to stun prey. And so if you follow me through this picture, you can see a thresher shark swimming into a school of fish. Um, here's scene two, scene three. Scene four, down here in the middle, you start to see it's uh, using its pectoral fins. Um, my mom calls these the arm fins. And it's starting to basically move its arm fins so that its body tilts down a little bit. So now the body is tilted down and it starts to raise its back half of its body. And in frame seven here, it starts to create this whip-like action where it flings its tail forward um, as seen in frame eight and nine to stun these fish. And so we were really excited to see that we have this behavior. We know that the vertebrae and the back half of the body are stiffer. And now we can see why this might actually be. And so this is what we call in biomechanics, um, building a really strong form and function relationship. So we understand how something is shaped and how it does and how those two things work together. So if we look back here at these special shark vertebrae, we can see that they are so much more fortified than some of these other species. And this might be to support this totally wild whipping action that the back end of this shark has to do. Um, so that was really exciting to see. And that's some of the um, exciting work we've been doing on vertebral columns right now. Um, in addition to these makos, like on the right-hand scene here where you can see all the plates, other species actually have a totally different mineralization. So on the left column, you have a blue shark. And in the middle, we have a great hammerhead. And they have big blocks or chunks of minerals. So very different from these plates that we've been looking at. So now we're starting to look at some of these plates to see how those work um, in terms of the 3D structure and how squishy these vertebrae are or how stiff they are um, and think about how that impacts swimming. So that's kind of what we're working on with hard stuff in my lab. Next, I wanna talk about shark skin. So the squishy stuff. And this is work that my PhD student, uh, Maddie Haygood has been working on. 
So uh, more than 40 years ago, in 1978, this really great paper came out where they were able to measure the pressures in a shark as it swam forward and think about how the shark was wrapped up um, with these basically um, crisscrossed fibers of collagen almost like one of those finger traps that you might have gotten a, as a kid at a party. Um, so we have this really intense mesh work and it was hypothesized that shark skin would work as an exotendon. And so as a shark swims, it has its skin around it working very similar to those full body swimsuits we saw people wearing in the Olympics like a decade or so ago. So if you remember back to the Olympics a while ago, Swimmers were wearing those full body swimsuits. Um, I should put a picture in here. I always assume people know what I'm talking about because I'm a swimmer. Um, so people were wearing those full body swimsuits and they were breaking world records left and right. They were swimming very fast. And the way these swimsuits work is they're very, very tight and you put them on and when you put them on, it essentially decreases any jiggle you might have in your body. And it helps you swim more efficiently and swim faster. And so that's basically what this exotendon hypothesis suggests is that shark skin is kind of working as one of those swimsuits to kind of tighten up and hold the shark tighter. And so its whole body is stiffer and it can swim more efficiently. And we see this in these whole body swimsuits we also see this if you're a runner and wear um, like running tights, compression tights when you run. Um, this can also be seen, um, you know, in those, those sports. And so 40 years ago, we had this idea that shark skin was working as an exotendon. Um, it was from one paper and, you know, they studied like one species and only a couple of specimens from that species. And as a scientist, this finding was really exciting, but you wanna know if it's repeatable and you wanna know more. And it turns out that in the past 40 years, not many people have thought about how stretchy shark skin might be. Most people, when they think about shark skin, think about these dermal denticles. So these are the little teeth that are found in shark skin that make shark skin feel like sandpaper. So if you pet a shark from head to tail, only do this in an aquarium and a touch tank when you're allowed to, if you touch a shark and go head to tail, you won't feel like as much sandpaper action. But if you go from the tail forward, you'll start to feel that sandpaper action um, quite intensely. And for the past 40 years, people have really been focusing on the hydrodynamics of this shark skin and these denticles in the skin. And what hydrodynamics means is studying the flow of water over this structure, because this is really weird, right? You might expect something that swims really fast to be really smooth, not have all these little teeth inside of it. And so what researchers have found was that these little teeth inside the skin actually change the way the water flows really close to the shark to help it swim faster. And that's all cool. You remember, I like poking things and stretching it and smashing it. So I wanted to understand how stretchy is shark skin and how does that work? So what we have been able to do is um, dissect shark skin from our specimens and we stretch it and we stretch it in different directions. So sometimes we're stretching the skin from the head to the tail of the shark. And sometimes we're stretching it in the hoop direction, which is basically like if our shark was wearing a belt. And we're starting to understand from stretching it in these different directions, how the shark skin works. And this is something you can totally do if you have any of those like compression tights for running um, or any gym gear, right? It's stretching in some directions more than it is in other directions. And this is what we're trying to understand about sharks and especially in different species like slow swimming versus fast swimming species. We've also found that as we increase the number of these little teeth in the shark skin, we can go here to see a more close up picture of these teeth. The more of these little teeth in the shark skin, 
the stiffer the shark skin is. So the harder it is, um, it's, it's better at resisting being pulled. And so that's really cool because it makes me think that maybe this shark skin could work as some sort of flexible armor for the shark um, uh, with these little denticles on it, in addition to being an exotendon. So what we're finding so far is that when we test different species, we're starting to see differences depending on how many of these little teeth are in the skin. But we're also starting to see differences if we test in the head to tail versus in the belt direction. And so we're learning a lot about how this squishy tissue works. And if we flip our shark skin over, remember we have all these collagen fibers and we had those collagen fibers arranged in like that finger trap meshwork. Um, and so we're starting to try to understand how the angles of this fiber um, network might impact how stretchy the skin is. And so far that does not seem to really correlate as well as the number of the denticles or these little teeth in the shark skin. So the teeth seem to be more important in determining how those properties work. So the more little teeth in the skin, um, the stiffer the skin is, um, which is cool thinking about it as an exotendon, but also potentially as a flexible armor for the shark. And, you know, we, we think about the density or how many of these little denticles are in a given area. And, I'm used to seeing pictures like this, where it looks nice and organized. And this is a great repeating pattern. It's kind of soothing to look at, I think. Um, but sometimes we see shark skin that's a total mess, like this. This is not organized at all. I have no idea how this would help with flow around the shark or impacting the mechanical properties. And so sometimes we're seeing specimens that have scars and skin that looks really disorganized, like maybe it has healed. And we started to look and we saw that some of the differences we were seeing in the organized versus very unorganized skin were on male and female sharks. And that got us thinking. Um, mating in sharks is a rather um, dangerous event for the female because males have to bite onto females for mating to happen. And so, Often at the end of shark mating, the females are left with um, wounds basically, um, and they get mating scars. And previous research has shown that shark skin in female sharks is actually thicker than in male sharks. So I had never thought to look at this before. We saw this, um, this microscope image of these shark denticles, but now we're really investigating the differences between male and female skin and also the thickness of the skin to understand how this exotendon works. And um, this is a lot of work we're doing now. I will definitely give you all um, some more exciting data in a few years and I will have many more answers um, you know, in about 30 years. So now I've told you about hard stuff, the skeletal elements squishy stuff, the shark skin. And now I want to talk about swimming and swimming in the wild in particular. And this is work that um, I've been doing with uh, former PhD student Sarah Hoffman and PhD student Braden Rohde and master student Ivan Hertigan. So normally in my lab, we study sharks swimming in tanks. You catch your shark, you put it in a tank, you videotape it swimming, and then you let it go. And I can actually learn an awful lot about watching a shark swim in a tank. And the way we do this is we take video of these animals swimming, and then we dress up our shark in the video with dots all over. And what this allows us to do is to deconstruct those many, many points along a live shark into just a few that we want to look at. And we can create different regions of the body, like the front half of the body and the back half of the body, which you may remember was a big deal to me when I was thinking about how squishy the vertebrae were. 
And by doing this, we're able to follow our shark through space and start to think about how it's moving over time. And if you look at the blue line here, this is the line produced by the head of the shark. And the red line is the line produced by the tail. So if you remember again, back to some of your early physics classes, um, you might have learned about wavelengths and amplitudes and frequencies. And just by looking at these two lines, they look really different, right? Um, this red line, um, if we go from valley to peak, is very different than if we go from valley to pink peak of this blue line. And what we were able to discover in the lab in these little hammerheads swimming around was the front half of the body and the back half of the body are operating at a different amplitude and different frequency from each other. And this was really exciting because normally when we think about how animals swim, we think about them generating a wavelength along their body that produces swimming. We don't often think about how they might be generating several wavelengths from different parts of their bodies. And one of the reasons this might be useful for a shark is as it's swimming, it needs to be able to move its head back and forth. So if we watch these hammerheads again, we can see their little heads yawing back and forth. So their heads are moving back and forth and their tail is moving back and forth. And we think this allows these animals to essentially be able to survey and look for food with their heads um, and also be able to swim. So you wanna be able to do both. And so this started me thinking about a couple of things like first breaking the body into the front and the back half of the body, thinking about where swimming is actually coming from. But it also made me start thinking about what happens if I study swimming as animals are doing different behaviors, right? Like a shark swimming by, grabs food, grabs a fish, and it keeps swimming. But does its swimming change at all as it's processing that prey? And so that's one of the things we're starting to look at in the lab, is what, what can we find with these sharks and understanding how swimming changes from the front half and the back half of the shark. But being in Florida, I was working in the lab and it became obvious that there was a big black tip shark aggregation that happens here every year. And some of you may have heard Dr. Kajura from the biology department talk about his work tagging sharks and counting the sharks along the coast of Florida. Well, he was showing me really amazing video from the airplanes where he could count thousands of sharks in a frame, frame of video. And, you know, I, I kept saying like, can you get closer so I can use your video to analyze, his, analyze their swimming? And he said, no, I'm in an airplane. I'm not getting closer to the water. And I said, fair enough, that, that makes sense. And so he got me started thinking about how I could study these animals swimming around in the shallow water here of South Florida. And so here is Florida, you know, we are here. Um, and this yellow line represents part of the aerial survey. Dr. Kajura has extended it down to Miami now, but this is where he had been flying and seeing a whole bunch of sharks. And I was thinking, how do we make this happen? And so I was looking for new grad students and I was able to find grad students who knew how to fly drones. And this worked out really well. So my grad student, Brayden Ruddy, will go out to the beach and she will toss up the drone and get video of sharks swimming around um, in the natural environment. And if you think back to that picture I showed you of the baby hammerhead swimming in the lab, this is pretty good quality video comparable to what I've gotten in the lab. And this is outside being a little laggy here at the moment, but you can see a hammerhead swimming and you can see it chasing these black tip sharks. And so what we've been able to do is start looking at swimming at sharks in the wild. And we can put dots on our sharks just like we do in the lab 
and we can separate their body into the front half and the back half of the shark, just like we do in the lab. And I was very excited to find that just like in the lab, we saw a decoupling or a difference between the way the front half of the body was moving and the way the back half of the body was moving. So I didn't just see something weird in the lab, which was really exciting to me because I was a little worried that the sharks were just swimming weird because they were in the lab, but we were able to show it in big black tip sharks swimming in the water that the front half of the body is going to move with an amplitude and frequency different than the back half of the body. And that was really cool. And we were able to show that in single sharks swimming around. And now, um, Brayden and the undergrad she works with are working on studying and understanding how these animals swim together in groups. So this is an interesting way to think about biomechanics and think about swimming. And the way you have all probably experienced this is in a crowded place. So um, imagine you're on the FAU campus and it's really early in the morning and nobody is on the breezeway on campus. You can walk down the breezeway and get to Starbucks really easy. You can walk as fast as you want. Nobody is around you. It's really easy. If you make the mistake to try to go to Starbucks right when a class gets out, there will be hundreds or more than hundreds of students on the breezeway, all pre-COVID of course, um, and it would be very difficult to walk because there are such big crowds. And so that's what we're working to quantify with these sharks swimming around is how do they swim by themselves compared to smaller groups or more densely packed groups? So how far away is their nearest neighbor? So, you know, you can think of it as, you know, you're walking down the breezeway and someone steps on the back of your heel as you're trying to walk kind of a thing. And again, this is something we've all experienced walking in crowded places. And now we're able to quantify how sharks deal with this same thing in big groups. And the last little bit I wanna talk about is some of um, Braden's really exciting data that she has been able to get from video we've gotten from our collaborator, um, Josh Jorgensen at Black Tip, Black Tip H, um, where Josh has been able to collect video of hammerhead sharks chasing these black tip sharks. So we'll just watch this video for a minute because I love watching it. But you can see this big hammerhead swimming around. It's very shallow. The beach is up at the top of your, your screen. You can see the waves breaking on the shore. And you can see just how close these black tips are getting to the shore. And you just saw the hammerhead maneuver and the hammerhead's dorsal fin was so shallow, it was breaking the surface of the water and creating a splash. And these black tip sharks have been shown to go up into the really shallow water as a refuge to get away from this predator. So now, in addition to understanding how sharks swim in the wild by themselves and in groups, now we can understand how these groups react when they have a predator nearby. The other really amazing thing about this video is I can learn how hammerhead sharks swim in the wild. Remember I showed you that video of the sharks swimming in the tank? Those were little itty bitty baby hammerheads. I can't put a big hammerhead in a tank. That would be way too stressful for um, the shark. And also maybe for the students who had to help me take care of the shark. Um, and we don't have tanks that big. So, you know, there's a, a lot of logistical issues with having a, a big shark in the lab. So we had those baby hammerheads in the lab. But now I have an opportunity to be able to study how these big hammerheads move um, in the ocean um, when they're full grown, which is really exciting. So again, we do just like what we were able to do in the lab is we're able to put dots on our sharks. And these are all drawn relative size. So the black tip sharks are usually about 187 centimeters tall. So about 5'9 or 5'10 if you're thinking about a human. And the hammerheads are often more than double the size of the black tip sharks. And what we've been able to find is that if we have a group of black tip sharks, we're gonna have a hammerhead come in and this black tip shark is going to swim away and the rest of the sharks will then swim away. 
And so as you move further away from the black tip shark, you're going to see differences in what these, what these hammerheads or what these little black tips are doing um, to get away from this predator. And so what Braden's been able to find is that um, when a black tip group is approached by a hammerhead, the frequency of their tail beat increases and the velocity changes and the amplitude of their swimming changes. So they're changing all kinds of variables when they see this predator come around. They notice there's a predator and they start to move faster and move quicker. Another interesting aspect of this is being able to look at the reaction of the group as you get further away from the predator. So you can imagine the sharks closer to the predator would react a little differently than the sharks, say, out here further away. The threat is less intense, right? So what Braden has been able to show is that as the distance from the predator increases, so the further you get away, speed of the sharks and how fast they're moving their tail and how far they're moving their tail from the center actually decrease. So these sharks out here in the corner further away from the predator are moving slower and with less uh, urgency than the sharks closer to this hammerhead predator. And again, thinking about how these animals move together in groups, um, we're able to think about what happens if you're in a more tightly packed group, if your neighbors are closer or farther away from you, as in the case of shark five and shark four being further away than say three and four. And so um, what Braden has found is that when your neighbors are further apart, your velocity and tail beat frequency increase. So your sharks are able to swim faster and also move their tails more um, when they're further apart. So maybe they're less restricted by having a neighbor very close to them. And so these are some of the things we've been able to do studying hard tissues, um, squishy tissues, and thinking about swimming um, in the wild. And again, um, this work is really exciting because it's something that we're able to do at FAU. And I can think of very few other places right now where I would be able to get this kind of video and start to ask these kind of questions and do this kind of science um, other than being right here where the water is really shallow and it's really clear. So this has been a really amazing opportunity um, for me in my lab. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, FAU and the FAU Elasmo Lab. So the shark lab has done a lot of work with the aerial surveys and the shark tagging of these black tips that helped us, uh, that helped alert me to the fact that they were out there first off and in such large numbers. Dr. Kajura says, you can always like go to the beach and basically throw a rock and hit a black tip shark. And so that's what really inspired me to say like, well, let's see what we can see with the drones. If they're that many, like, why not? Um, our work is supported by the National Science Foundation um, the Colgan Foundation supports the Shark Lab and the Save Our Seas Foundation supports both of these labs because we are doing a lot of work with a lot of specimens and a lot of species. We have great collaborators um, in Florida with Florida Fish and Wildlife and also nationally with um, NOAA. Um, and then because we are flying drones, um, we need to be FAA compliant. I'd also like to thank the following societies who help support my graduate students with their research. The Marine Technology Society, Society for Experimental Biology, Society for Integrative and Comparative Biology, and the National Sea Turtle Foundation have all been very generous and helped out my students a lot. So um, thank you for um, tuning in and I will take any questions you might have. Thank you, Marian. Um, that was very interesting and a little bit startling, I must say, going to the to the ocean here, um, to the beach here. Now you showed a lot of the black tip sharks and uh, also some hammerheads. Uh, are the black tip sharks uh, the most prevalent that you find off the coast here? Um, during the migration um, that Dr. Kajura studies, so from like January through April, the black tip sharks are probably the most numerous right close to shore. Um, and that's what we've seen in the drone video as well. Um, 
the predators are fewer and further between. Uh, but it is worth noting that the black tip sharks, um, some of them are here year round. So they don't just all leave for good. Some of them hang around. And that was actually my next question. It's seasonal <laughs> that they are actually off the shore here. It's seasonal that they're off the shore in such big numbers, but they're always around. Great. All right, let's get to our questions here. Just as a reminder, if you have a question for Dr. Porter, please open your Q&A button and you can type your question there. All right, let's see. Um, you, you showed quite a few um, ways of how you're tracking these sharks. And, and one of the questions that uh, we have here is your, if you're, you can use software to automate uh, the tracking of the, the movement of the sharks. That is a great question. and. There is more and more software that is getting better and better. So the movement of the sharks in the lab, um, we could probably automate that now. Of course, now we're trying to look at the sharks outside. And the problem with the software that we've had with the sharks outside in the wild is in the lab, you're filming a tank that has a very, like a clear bottom, right? You can make the bottom a single color there's not a lot of structure. You go to film outside and you've got nice sandy areas, but then your shark will swim over a patch of rock or rubble or coral and the automated software, it will be following the shark over the sand. And then as soon as there's a shadow or there's um, a, some rubble, the dots on the shark kind of explode like confetti over the, <laughs> the computer screen. And so these programs are getting better and better. And um, yeah, we're, <laughs> we're hopeful that one day it will all be automated. But now we just all wear glasses because we put little dots all over the sharks all the time. <laughs> that must be very onerous. Um, so a, a much, much broader question that one of our attendees uh, brought up is whether you have a vision for using the information that you're gathering to assist with shark con conservation. That's a great question. Um, so in terms of conservation, you know, what we do is important because we're understanding kind of basic movement and basic physiology. And if you think about how animals move, you can think about movement over the course of their lives. You can think of it over a migratory feet, uh, season you can think of it over a feeding event um, or just like swimming from one place to another over the course of a few seconds. And so to really understand these animals and what they're capable of and what they do, we kind of need to look at all levels. And that's where my work kind of fits in is sort of we have um, what I was just describing is called the like the paradigm in movement ecology is understanding movement really small and really big scales. And so you could just focus at really big scales and say, they go here and here and here, but you would miss out on some of the information that you might have at the smaller scales. So um, while we're not tracking or tagging them, um, we are contributing a lot to understanding the basic physiology and basic science of how these move. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, Understanding animals we don't know a lot about is always a little bit conservation, right? Because we're learning more about them. Right, absolutely. I would agree with that. You know, it all contributes. Uh, you know, we yeah. need to have the foundation before we can even get to the conservation piece. Um, exactly. Coming back to some of the, um, you know, you showed videos where you had juvenile hammerheads in your tank in, in a lab. Um, the question here is, what is the advantage or the benefit for having juvenile hammerheads in, in the lab rather than some uh, smaller species like uh, bonnet heads or even the black tips? Yeah, so that's a great question. And actually for that study, we were looking at black tips or we were looking at hammerheads and bonnet heads. So we were actually looking at both. Um, I show the hammerhead video just because we go back to the hammerheads later. But we've also looked at bonnet heads. So we look at um, many species that are lab appropriate, not just those. Um, and in terms of species that are lab appropriate, we can do what you said. We can look at just species that are smaller, or we can look at the smaller individuals of a species. And we do both. So it's um, opportunistic about kind of what we're able to do um, 
what sharks are available in different locations. Yeah, and coming, you know, a, a follow up question here uh, with the behavior of these hammerheads in the tank versus the wild. You didn't um, mention that you saw a similar um, uh, swimming pattern uh, when you compared the, the ones in the tank versus the one in the wild. But the question here is, did you see any change in behavior with the sharks that were in the tank in your lab versus the sharks in the wild? So our kinematics data suggests that their swimming is very similar. Um, in terms of behavior, I mean, they're in a tank, so they're swimming in circles and they've got their food handed to them. So their behavior is very different in the lab. Um, based on the actual measurements I made of their swimming, they seem to match up pretty well with what we're seeing in the wild. So um, that gives us some confidence that what we're seeing in the lab also reflects what, what they do in the wild. Of course, in the wild, they've got way more space. So the range of behaviors you might see in the wild would be um, way more than what you might see in the lab. Right. All right. Uh, coming back to your, you showed a lot of pictures of the vertebrae and yeah. the skel a skeletal structure of the sharks. Um, how many vertebrae are in a shark skeleton? That is a great question. And that is another really weird thing about sharks. So, you know, in humans, we all have like the same number of vertebrae, um, many, many mammals, the same sharks, hugely variable. Some species have like 100 vertebrae, some species have like 200 vertebrae. And it's one of the really cool things that I actually used robotics during my postdoc work to study how changing the number of vertebrae and the spacing between your vertebrae impacts your swimming. So yeah, that's a super interesting question. And there is a huge amount of variability among species. Very interesting. Um, also related to the uh, vertebrae and the CT scans that you showed uh, of the vertebrae, one of our attendees noticed that there is an X shape structure. Is there a purpose to that? Yeah, so I didn't get to talk about all the structures. And so um, if I can go back to the CT scan, um, I think you're talking about this X shape, right? Yeah, so that is something that is found in shark vertebrae, but also most fish vertebrae will have that um, kind of hypermineralized shape. And we call it the double cone structure. Um, and it basically creates sort of this concave surface on um, the anterior and the posterior surfaces. And I mean, what I think is happening is when I squish the vertebrae, I actually squish them from like the top of the screen down. So I'm squishing. And I'm wondering if this actually works as some sort of like scissor jack or scissor mechanism to help it kind of squish down a little bit, but then come back up is part of the springy mechanism. That is my hypothesis. Um, but yeah, no, that's a really great question. And we've actually measured the angles of these and have been able to correlate them to the mechanical properties like stiffness too. So yeah, that is something uh, I didn't have time to talk about all the things, but yeah, great, great eye. They are very, very cool. <laughs> we have another question related to the vertebrae and the density. Um, the question here is, does the amount of denticles come into play with the shark's flexibility as well? For example, if a shark with a really dense amount of denticles on the skin and a very dense and thick vertebra would, could cause a, that a particular shark uh, could have move as easily. Right, and so that's why I'm studying kind of the hard bits and the squishy bits to see how it changes um, among species, right? Because you have some species that are slower, just kind of hanging out, like maybe the nurse sharks we see around here. And then you've got things like Makos that are super fast swimming sharks. And, you know, what's the difference between those? So that's that's kind of what I hope to answer before I retire, for sure. <laughs> I will get back to you. And, uh, and, and actually coming back again to the vertebra segments of the photos, uh, at, at which parts of the vertebra segments are those photos from? And, and the question is also, are these segments from Thresher and which species of Thresher? Volpinos, Supercilius? <laughs> Somebody has really a knowledge of shark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so these are Thresher vertebrae right here. 
let me find the, the orange one. Um, these are the thresher vertebrae. And I want to say it's vulpinus, but we've tested a whole bunch. We've looked at about 50 species so far. And so, um, you know, I, I just wanted to show a small smattering here. Um, but yeah, and then I saw another question. Um, <laughs> did you say you're going to dissect great white sharks? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, those are, we get specimens from all over and sometimes we get specimens from fishing tournaments, um, from mortalities. So um, I, I always say I'm sort of like a scientific vulture. Um, something <laughs> dies, people call me, I go dissect stuff. Um, or I oh, get forensics. weird stuff in the mail. <laughs> yeah, I get weird stuff in the mail too, um, vertebrae wise. But. Yeah. All right, we're just about out of time. I know we have a number of additional questions. So what we would do is we're going to ask you, Dr. Porter, to answer those offline. We will post the answers together with a recording of today's presentation on our website. Uh, I want to finish with one question that has been asked a few times here. There have been interests from, I, I guess, students on how they can get involved with your research. Uh, you know, and several of them are not here in, in Florida. How can they get involved with your research? Um, that is a great question. Um, a lot of what we're doing right now is socially distanced because of COVID. I have no idea how long that will last. Um, but for FAU students, I would say, um, to get involved, contact the Office of Undergrad Research and Inquiry, the OURI office on the FAU campus. If you are a student who wants to get involved in research from somewhere else, there are some great opportunities from the National Science Foundation called Research Experiences for Undergraduates. Mm -hmm. And um, there are people studying biomechanics around the country who have um, opportunities like this. Um, I think many of the deadlines have passed because they're summer programs generally, but I know that there are opportunities at um, the University of Washington's Friday Harbor Labs. Um, I think there are some classes um, at Shoals Marine Labs. So there, there are some different opportunities um, okay. for, for people around. Yeah, and if you're here on campus and you're looking for a uh, particular project you might be interested in, we do have a virtual platform. Platform it's called Team Sparks um, that you can use and look for projects that you might be interested in. Okay, with that, I uh, thank you, Marianne, very much for the uh, really great. Uh, videos <laughs> and and I learned a lot about sharks it's uh, still a little scary to me that I go to the beach and there are so many sharks <laughs> it's fine it's fine yeah I know um <laughs> all right thank you everybody for attending again again we're going to have Dr. Porter answer the remaining questions offline and we'll post the answers on our website with that thank you again for attending have a great rest of your day